Hi, welcome to Sportsy. Let's talk sports. We have spoken to so many athletes and administrators, and we understand always one part that people need to be aware of what they do, and uh, there's there's a field who makes them aware, and that is law. So today we have with us Ahana Mehrotra. She is the founder of AIM Sports Law and Management Company and partner at TMT Law Practices. She is an ILS Law Pune graduate. We after that she went on to do her master from UCLA in Entertainment, Intellectual Property and Sports Law. She is one of the first sports law sports lawyer, women sports lawyer in India, and had an amazing journey working with uh, ISLs and uh, table tennis league and so many other athletes. This field is always something that people need to know about, and as as they say, we need to be aware of the things rather than uh, getting into the problems. Uh, so, to understand what problems there are and what kind of uh, what is the field sports law field for India is, please welcome Ahana Mehrotra. Thank you for watching. Thank you for liking and thank you for sharing. But please do subscribe on the channel Sportsy Say that help us spread the word. We go by the same name Sportsy Say across all the social media handles. Please do subscribe on the channel Sportsy Say. That Hi Anna, great to have you on Sportsy. Let's talk sports. Hi Sayed, how are you doing? All all good, all good, and great to have you. And uh, honestly speaking, it is a right time for me to get you uh, on this on this platform after uh, listeners have uh, listened to so many athletes and uh, administrators from sports industry to understand uh, their challenges and how they deal with it uh, so uh, getting a, a legal aspect and legal understanding about the sports in india i think it is the right time for us to get you so really uh, appreciate your time and thank you to uh, th really thank you to be here today no, no, thank you so much for having me. It's a great opportunity for me. I should feel honored given the guests you've had. So that's that. So okay. This should be Thanks exciting. Yes, I'm looking forward to the next 25-30 uh, minutes so to be full of uh, uh, full of legal. Legal sports. <laughs> let's, let's make it It's legal very sports. boring. It's very boring. Trust me, it's not the fun side. It's even it's the fun side of law, but it's not the fun side of sport. See, I, 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 have, I have enjoyed suits. So I, I'm, I'm hoping the, the law is always good. So, so I'm not a Netflix <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Netflix person, but the only reason I watched like four seasons of Suits was to be able to in let people know that what we do is nothing like what they show in. Uh, it's like Grey Anatomy. Any doctor yeah. says we don't do like this. It's not yeah, like, yeah. our, yeah, our exactly. life is not a Grey Anatomy. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Boston Legal is still more realistic. Suits is complete. Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> it's unimaginable. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, so for our viewers, uh, we have uh, Anna uh, Merotra with us. Uh, she's an ILS uh, Pune uh, legal uh, law graduate, uh, UCLA law school, uh, doing her master's in entertainment and intellectual property, and been working with law, sports law specifically, and entertainment media law for quite some time. She has her own uh, venture, AIM sports, uh, sports Law and Management Company. She is also a partner in TMT Law Practice. So, yeah, whatever she does is about law and making sure her party is always safe. And the best thing that she has mentioned uh, to me is like she's working, she's passionately working towards uh, India's Olympic dream. So, uh, Ahana, it is great to have you here and person like you who can actually help the sport industry to grow because that's where we need, that's what we need in India. It's going to a lot of economics are dependent on the way sports grows. So it's great to have you here. Uh, so I'm jumping to my first question. It is like uh, the way the lawyers have the questions, right? Full of questions. So I'm here sitting full of questions. So I, I, uh, I, I, whenever we spoke, I, I've known that you have played multiple sports at multiple levels, representing India in under-19 cricket as well. But why, after doing so many things at district level and the India 19 level, what made you choose a career in law? Wow. So I think I've been asked this question too frequently, but it's something that, you know, I, I enjoy most talking about my journey. So I think I decided that I wanted to go to law school when I was in class five or class six. I decided pretty early oh. that I wanted to be a lawyer. 
And uh, at that point in time, I never thought that uh, I'll make it to the level that I did make it as far as sport is concerned. I used to actually passionately play tennis at that point in time. Till about, just about the age of 12 or 13, I used to actually play lawn tennis. Mm-hmm. And uh, I moved to boarding school at the age of 12. I went to Mayo. And when I went to Mayo, a sudden shift happened. I played tennis for about a year and then I moved to cricket as a sport. I took up cricket full time. And I guess uh, because everybody knew that I, you know, and started excelling at cricket, then I guess everybody figured that uh, she can play any sport. So wherever they required, they felt short of someone, they should just throw me in, right? For the <laughs> in, the, in the house team, they said, Achha, like, there's nobody in water polo, let's throw her in a, into water polo. There's nobody in this, let's throw her in. So that's how, I mean, one sport grew to another. And literally, I mean, uh, I never got the opportunity to represent India. My selection had happened in the in a, India on the 19 team when I was in class 12, which is like two, two months before my class 12 board exams. In fact, I still remember when we had gone for our nationals, uh, we had lost really badly to both, uh, it was Andhra Pradesh and I think Haryana that we played. And we lost really badly to both of them. So I looked at my coach and I said, listen, I have my board exams two months away. I don't think it's right for me to stay for the closing ceremony. I'm just going to leave earlier. And uh, anyways, uh, you inform me about how things go for the, you know, we didn't have any more matches. Mm -hmm. So, and then I just come back. I booked tickets. I came back from Bhopal and and, um, I, I think I took a day off to just like rest it out and get in the groove of studying. And I just about opened my books is when I got a call from my coach saying, hey, too bad the team played badly, but uh, you've gotten, managed to get selected for India 19. <laughs> and I think I just opened my book and I shut it right there. I said, thinking that, oh, wow, like now I get admission anywhere and everywhere in sports quota. That wasn't the case, though. Uh, there were very few places in India which had a women's cricket team, so to speak, at yeah. that point in time. I mean, women's cricket was not even under BCCI in 2005-2006. Women's right. cricket was a different body altogether. We only came under BCCI in 2008. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, obviously there was, I don't think it was an option at all ever that at, at least at that point of time to not complete my formal education and jump into sport right away because that wasn't the career path. And that's, uh, and so then I decided to give up cricket in its entirety and went to law school instead. But at law school, you know, that burning desire to reconnect with sport was always there. In fact, I remember uh, another funny story. I went to my college uh, university representative. There was an intra-college sports tournament that we have at ILS towards the end of each year. And, uh, you know, I told him, I said, hey, uh, there's no cricket for women, but I'd like to play on the boys' team. So he turned around and said, he, he said, do you know we play with a leather ball? I said, do you know that I almost got selected to play India? And he's taken <laughs> aback. <laughs> so... So then he was, I mean, he didn't let me play on the men's team, but he was nice enough to arrange for like a women's tournament that year, as far back mm-hmm. as uh, this was 2006. I think, I don't know if ILS still has a women's cricket tournament, but okay. uh, I mean, yeah, so that's when I sort of reconnected with sport a year later. And then it was like, okay, I need to connect with sport professionally is when I decided to pursue a career in sports law. And then that's when one thing just led to another. Nice. So that's so, essentially uh, how some whole mix of sport and uh, law happened. Yeah, and and uh, be, being an athlete, obviously, uh, that time you probably never understood. Like uh, we never understand while playing that the importance of the other aspects which are required. Uh, but I think now, if you look back, I think there are a lot of aspects that you might relate to the sports law and as a practitioner that you could actually help the athlete with uh, or or a league and team with now. Of course, I mean, uh, so obviously, I mean. Sports law, so to speak, has only, uh, you know, become a known field over the last half a decade. Before that, was still very restricted. I mean, back in 2011, when I told people I wanted to specialize in this area, people would just frown at me and say, what is this? You know, is that, does that even exist? What are you talking? So, I mean, of course, at that point in time, I was probably the first woman who was doing this in India. Mm-hmm. So I'd walk into a room and I'd still get frowns saying, what's a woman doing here? But the fact that, you know, I had a fair bit of technical knowledge of various sports, having played them. Mm -hmm. And in general, being a sports enthusiast following sport, because I could talk about the rules of the game and how it could work, or I could understand what the leg side and the off side was. (laughs) (laughs) 
is uh, is when people became more receptive they said, okay fine she knows what she's talking you know so it was one of those okay. things nice so uh, and how did you decide to go to ucla it's, it's one of the amazing institute when you actually go for any courses but uh, yeah for they are known for their law and sports law so how did actually that happen uh, so, did you okay sorry yeah. no, no no go ahead go ahead no so it, it was it because uh, there were no specializations uh, available in india uh, or that is what you had in mind i mean like i said there was a whole lot of apprehension with regard to a specialization in sports law when i was deciding to do my masters also it wasn't very easy i mean in the sense that i think i took certain things for granted back in the day and i'm never ashamed to admit my failures i think they only taught me so i mean i also used to write a whole lot especially in school i don't think i wrote as much while i was in college but i used to write a whole lot when i was in school like uh, i was the editor for my school magazine and school newsletter for like 3 years in a row and stuff like that so i think i somewhere took writing for granted right and then i had actually applied for my masters in 2010 to be able to then finish law school in 2011 and jump straight into a masters rather than uh stopping for a year studying uh working gaining some work experience and then going ahead to study but uh, when i applied to my masters in 2010 i had applied to so i had done like basically a research of all the law schools in america that had a course on sports law but i also i was also always looking at law schools which offered courses and were recognized for ancillary areas so which okay. was entertainment intellectual property media etc etc cuz i mean again it was a it was, I was investing about 75 or lakhs to a crore of rupees in doing okay. the masters and uh, you know if there was so much of a big question mark in terms of whether i'll be able to recover the money that i was going to invest so i wanted to have some sort of backup so i applied to about 8 to 10 law schools in 2010 and uh, simply because i don't i don't think i thought through my statement of purposes mm-hmm. i got rejected to all eight law schools <laughs> and uh, well it was a bit of a reality check and i said wow like uh, because my scores weren't bad it was just basically a phase where i i don't i don't think i just put too much thought in my application process um and the year after i worked for a year the year after when i looked at those documents to rework those documents and reapply even to me there were just a bunch of disconnected paragraphs out there i was like what was i thinking last year basically <laughs> that So when I reapplied, actually, I was fortunate enough. One year later, not much had changed. I'd only worked for about six months by then, and I got into all eight law schools. That's when I became wow. spoiled, spoiled for choice. So I mean, I I still remember the first uh, law school that I had gotten into was USC, and then a bunch of others followed, and then Duke happened. Now Duke was uh, yeah. ranked amongst the top 10 universities for law in the US at that point in time still is for that matter yeah US, uh, UCLA features in the top 15 so i mean when i was going it was at 14 if i'm not wrong and duke was at about 8 and that's when the big debate happened in my head and in fact i'd already paid up at duke in terms of my reservation speed reservation fee etc mm-hmm. i'd also done my visa for duke and uh, what duke did offer to me was that um, they actually run a program in collaboration with university of geneva in geneva mm. so you can do up to 6 credits in the university of geneva even though they'll have like experts right. expert faculty from both duke and university of geneva so i had even enrolled for that program and uh, that's when my admission came through to ucla and suddenly <laughs> there was a big question mark in my head I said okay, and then when I when you know I sat to do a SWOT analysis of sorts, it was basically um, you know everybody turned around and said, hey, don't look at just the university name. Look at the specific course that you want to do. Mm-hmm. So for entertainment law, I mean, there's no denying the fact that UCLA was is the number one course in the world as far as entertainment law is con- okay. concerned, especially because they have the faculty that they have because they actually get professionals from Hollywood and yeah, uh, next next, next door do- for them. absolutely right and uh, they had professors like nimmer who's like the authority on copyright you know i mean it's the most popular book out there nimmer on copyright that there is so they had professors like nimmer who were teaching so i went more after the course and the faculty than the overall college ranking and that's how then i decided to pick ucla i still went ahead and did that course in geneva and okay. i wrote to ucla i said i'm doing six credits here will you accept and they said no we won't accept it so for me to add those 
that certification ex of extra credits wasn't so important it was more about being trying being able to grab the best of both worlds right. so i did get some experience of duke uh, mm -hmm. you know the faculty was really nice out there and uh, you know i made some amazing friends who i'm still friends with to this date as far as duke is concerned so i knew the whole batch of like 2013 from duke, duke law school who came to switzerland and of course uh, ucla 2013 batch uh, but yeah so that was basically and what was the icing on the cake and i think if even for a moment there was a doubt in my head with regard to i should have picked ucla i, I should have picked duke over ucla i think that got cleared uh, with an opportunity that i myself at the time of you know con sort of confirming my admission to ucla didn't have an idea about so ucla what they allow you to do is do up to four uh, four credits worth of practical training mm -hmm. and uh, that is subject to you getting picked on campus in an interview but uh, so i was really fortunate that i got picked on i sat for that uh, campus interviews and i was really fortunate that uh, i got picked on campus by warner brothers so i got oh. to work at warner warner brothers for about 6 months finish those four credits at warner brothers so that sort of gave me the experience even though i was always clear in my head that i wanted to come back to india and work and i never wanted to stay in the us but that definitely gave me that experience of what the work atmosphere abroad is of that matter specifically right. in america and working in their intellectual property to, uh, department and the anti piracy department was i think one of the best experiences i've had as far as work is concerned no doubt so, no doubt. so, so yeah it's been I, i've been uh, lucky to be at the right place at the right time i guess uh, uh, as far as certain that, decisions are concerned i think that is exactly what matters uh, right place at the right time uh, be it your sporting career or be it your uh, professional career i think anywhere that that is what matters so now coming yeah so coming from your the the journey of being a lawyer uh, of becoming a lawyer to being a lawyer uh, and that to in sports so uh, what are aspects of uh, sports which are covered in the sports law and uh, how much of it is actually generic and how much is specific uh, now let's talk about indian sports and indian law so right. how do you differentiate that So um, a lot of people in India, especially, think that sports law is a misnomer. There's nothing called a sports law. It's sports and the law, basically that. So I mean, of course, there is laws of the game, right? Which is hardcore sports yeah. law, so to speak. And then you have the World Anti-Doping Agency, which is has the anti-doping regulations, which is hardcore specific sports law. And then, of course, you have the Court of Arbitration for sport. We have our own dispute resolution mechanism, etc. so that is what you put under the realm of sports law but the mm -hmm. otherwise there are so many ancillary areas especially intellectual property like trademarks is the right. end all and be all of what we do right i mean today in any sponsorship transaction merchandising transaction advertising the transaction all your you know exploiting is the trademark yeah. i mean and then there is the broadcasting laws that exist where there's things like compulsory sharing of uh, feed of events of national importance so there's broadcasting laws involved then of course there's advertising law involved which is basically that you can't advertise alcohol products you can't ad advertise tobacco products or for that matter gambling uh talking about gambling from there we jump into gaming so there's a whole lot of uh, on the tech side there's data privacy involved there is uh, you know other things that come into come into play so the whole bunch of and then of course there is in india of course we don't treat cricket especially in a football context we don't treat sports persons as employees yeah. uh, it's a principal to principal relationship but otherwise even you know uh, elsewhere abroad labor laws come into pic the picture yeah. taxation laws especially i mean in, I, i still remember in 2018 when gst came into effect uh, no suddenly <laughs> uh you had to pay gst on barter deals as well so it was like yeah. okay everybody's trying to sort of you know put a figure on the value of barter deals so on and so forth so i mean a whole lot of complexities and a whole lot of ancillary laws come into picture mm -hmm. and that's what it is so it's uh, i mean even as a sports lawyer you have to have i mean uh you have to be a an expert lawyer or a good lawyer to then mm -hmm. be able to excel in sports law without being a good lawyer i don't think you can excel in uh, any field of law for that matter you have to understand the basics right uh, so yes, that's I, what it is i th i think that that covered probably two three of my different questions in one that's one <laughs> statement that you made <laughs> uh, so uh, i but i think it will bang on i think that is that is what you're looking at it's a fundamental which are required and beyond that you look for a specialization and that's what uh, you bring to table uh 
so uh, but now if uh, you you work as uh, in with Warner Brothers in, in the US in entertainment uh, you understood the whole UCLA based model and the international model and came to India and practicing in India one of the probably the first women in sports uh, law uh, that you are uh, so I always tell whether that she is collecting the group of women in sports everywhere so I said yes the women in sports law first one is, yeah. is Anna. <laughs> so uh, so since India is a developing market and we are perpetually developed market for going to be for quite some time. It is, right. uh, I don't, because the way India is a perpetual developing country, uh, the, right. I think uh, the, the, the sports and the, the sports law also is going to be uh, developing for quite some time. So what aspects are maximum use in the sports law when it comes to athlete or when it comes to uh, the league or a property? I mean, contract law is the basis of everything, right? I mean, contract law just functions on like, three essentials, which is offer acceptance and consideration. So if you know what contract law is about, then that's your basics to start with. I mean, of course, with years of experience, like uh, in my probably first year, which is 2013, when I worked on my first league, which is the badminton, uh, then it was called the Indian Badminton League, now called the Premier Badminton League. So I structured both, right, IBL and PBL in 2015. So when, you know, of course, working on the IBL side of things, it was my first league that I started out with in India. Um, I was only like basics. My boss was only telling me, okay, put this into the contract, right? Build it in. But of course, having gained that experience and having then worked in 2014 on the ISL side and then 2015 moved on to the team side of things. And then 2015, again, sat down to structure the table tennis league and then the snooker league and volleyball. And like so many things happened after that, that more than just, what I was drafting in terms of contracts and that whole advisory, of course, I mean, given my interest in sports law, having studied in depth, uh, I was aware of the rules and regulations. So, you know, drafting an anti-piracy, anti-corruption policy, or for that matter, anti-racism policy or anti-doping policy for a particular league or a tournament wasn't the hard thing to do. But it was more about then eventually today, and that's the reason I run a sports law and management firm because I do so much management advisory. Yeah. Uh, you know, just understanding the commercials of a transaction. And that's why sometimes, you know, I, I mean, I'm doing more in terms of uh, spending a whole bunch of hours in terms of just telling people that, okay, maybe the numbers that you have are too high or for that mm-hmm. matter, your estimate is too low. And right. this is probably a better way to structure it. And it was nice that, uh, I mean, COVID also threw a fresh bunch of challenges at yeah. us in terms of from a commercial viability, not just from the way you, you know, then that, when, if you understand the commercials behind it is when you're able to draft a contract. I mean, it's not as, as uh, you know, everybody are, who's not a lawyer thinks that contracts are extremely complex and supposed to be drafted in an absolute technical legal language contracts can be drafted as simply as possible you know in a language that most people understand so i think once you have like the basic understanding of how you work even from a broadcast perspective right most people don't understand that you have a def- different production team that you hire yeah. is the one that you bring on ground and then there's an uplinking process there's a downlinking process right. how the clean feed then is you know advertisements are added on to it so if you understand the transaction is when you'll be able to write that contract down. So right. I think basically what I said earlier that having the knowledge of other laws is extremely important to then be able to structure a perfect sports transaction. Right. And of course, with experience comes the whole commercial understanding. Yeah. Right? So, so when I, you work on various transactions is when you know. Yeah. So I think, yeah, uh, what, what you said about experience is matters the most. And what I'm getting from here, you can correct me if I'm wrong is uh, only sports law is something will not take you to the level that you are or where you want to be. And the understanding of uh, considering sports, media, entertainment as a whole bunch together along with IP, I think that combination is more apt than only looking at sports law and specialized in sports law. If- Absolutely. I mean, today okay. with the advent of technology and the, hum- I mean, you know, with esports getting the kind of numbers that we have seen, especially over the last six months, yeah. There's so many other things that you need to understand. I mean, everybody now is suddenly talking about data privacy. Everybody's talking about image yes. rights. Athletes are coming together to file suits in terms of how video gaming companies can't use their image or something yes. even similar. I mean, all kinds of issues are rising, right? So if you don't understand the basics, then how are you going to get into, like, from an athlete perspective or from a rights holder perspective, how are you going to get down to protecting their rights? Yeah. But 
<laughs> like in you said, India, it's still a it's still a developing field in India, especially and especially because athletes don't make the kind of money that they you know make abroad. Yes. So it is a bit of a ta- challenge in terms of them being able to afford specialists, or for that matter, them even understanding their rights, or for that matter, I mean, today the market size is also small, right? So they're only. I mean, it's literally in the sports industry. I don't even think it's six degrees of separation. I think it's only two degrees of separation. Everybody yeah. knows everyone because the industry is so close knit and so exactly, small. Yeah. But uh, it's it's great that new players are coming in. New new as- aspects are being explored. Like I I uh, absolutely enjoy it when um, you know clients pick up the phone and want to brainstorm on a new idea which they mm-hmm. suddenly thought of. And, and especially now today, there's so much happening in terms of. Uh, from a games of skill perspective, I think everybody got super excited when the Dream Eleven figures, yes. in terms of their valuation, were published sometime last year. I think it was 2018 when they were published the first time. And then some, suddenly everybody got excited that okay, yes. let's explore the games of skill market. And then suddenly, over the last eight eight months, we've seen a shift from people not suddenly people realize that hey, if there's no life sport, there's no fantasy. So now let's move away from fantasy and let's look at the KBC model, so to speak, yeah. or the e-gaming model, or for that matter, other other sort of you know games are skills. So it's been uh, uh, definitely an interesting time to watch for in the coming time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, while you were saying, the, there were few uh, ghanties were happening in my brain about which question should I ask first. Let me go <laughs> to uh, so because you spoke about the fantasy and game of skills, you spoke about the athlete, you spoke about the esports. Uh, so I said, let me start. P- Prioritizing my question, I think let's let's go with the athlete first. Uh, how much uh, as we as we know that most of the athlete no don't know only probably cricket is the area where athlete have, can manage to have their own uh, sports management institute or or a lawyer at certain level because I, me working with Amahi and other other deals we usually look at infringement we look at the confidentiality and consumer protection act there are a few things that we look at and then uh, we usually feel right. discovered but how much. Uh, the way, uh, like Pro Kabaddi League, the, I have seen Pro Kabaddi League teams taking the efforts mm-hmm. of teaching their uh, athletes about the PR etiquettes and other things. How much of this kind of right. training for required and actually happening in Indian market for understanding the legal aspects of sports? See, what you have to understand is that <clears throat> sport, a sports career in itself is extremely short-lived, right? It yeah. is then, at the end of the day, a well-managed set of image rights that can help you earn an income for the rest of your life yeah. for that matter. I mean, today, a couple Dev is still very relevant in the market. Sunil Gavaskar is still very relevant in the market. Of course, they're legends in their own way. So that's the reason yeah. also why they're, but today that is the role of sports management companies or for that matter, what Pro Kabaddi is trying to do. They're trying to build, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the image aspect of these players, they're trying to yeah. build upon it to be to then be able to commercialize it. So from a from coming from that space, it's extremely aid important to conduct yourself in a particular mm-hmm. manner. I mean, we saw the whole outro that took place with regard to that whole Hardik Pandya Coffee with Karan episode. Yeah, Coffee with Karan. Yeah. I mean, uh, Gillette withdrew their endorsement deal with him, and things like that happened simply. So. I mean, because you're, and today even like say the Advertising Council of India, uh, they say that sports persons are essentially persons who are in this, they include sports persons in their definition. So they say that, you know, because you're in the position to be able to influence others is why you're supposed to be conducting yourself in a particular yeah. manner. So you're not supposed to be indulging in like false advertising. So because everybody knows that you're in that position. So from a, you know, and again, talking about, uh, you need to understand doping laws. You need to understand your rights. You need to conduct yourself in a certain manner. Only when you understand all of that, you'll get to the commercial side of things. You have to understand the three plus rule in terms of yeah. how, when you're working for a team, you must work with others. And that's how you can in- differentiate between a brand that sponsors yeah. your team versus an individual brand, if they're competing brands. So all of that comes in step by step. I mean, otherwise, I don't think people who are not familiar with how this whole transaction works and how the distinction is created would be able to really capitalize on the commercial aspect. And that's when mm. it comes to, you know, and even like you mentioned, like cricketers, I think it's only the uh, popular cricketers who are yeah, who handful, sort of made handful it, of I mean, them, yeah. yeah, handful cricketers who ha- get lawyers or sports managers on board. I mean, it's 
uh, some of the organizations like for example baseline is doing great work picking up yes. budding talent and you know promoting them and things like that helping them get certain deals but otherwise i think as far as statistics go 80% of the sponsorship transactions as far as sports uh, persons are concerned in india is with cricketers and yes. of which i think 66% is with uh, dhoni and virat kohli so that <laughs> yeah. is what the what the statistic <laughs> is correct <laughs> with the, you know then in that virushka is a separate brand altogether and all yes. of that but it's just like basically that you have to you to be able to capitalize on any of that you have to know how to conduct yourself and obviously people who have got to have that faith in you right mm-hmm. so you can't yeah. uh, tomorrow if people get the perception that you've got where you've got because you've been cheating or mm-hmm. because you've been playing unfairly because look i mean the whole um economics of sport is based on a fan base right Okay. So your fan base has got to have faith in you at the end of the day, and that that that's largely to do with the way you conduct yourself. And for that, okay. I mean, if you need assistance of people like lawyers, like managers, I think a lot of us go out there and do pro bono work. So it's just about being able to reach out in some way or the other okay. to then be able to okay. assist yeah. you. I think it's it's a very valid point. The way people are uh, the teams and leagues are taking effort to make heroes and sheroes by. teaching them how to conduct themselves i think having understanding of law uh, basic law not in detail basic law about again make towards the image of the person and should not be cheating and all those thing like uh, like integrity managing integrity in exactly. sports i think this is something really important and i think uh, that is what yeah. that's why i call it developing thing right i us. mean there was such a massive outrage with regard to yuvraj singh having made that comment right he used the word yeah. hungi or something and that was such a massive outrage i mean even though he didn't do it from a coming from a racist perspective he didn't yeah. intend to be racist <clears throat> about it but uh, i mean things today the, the audience has become so um sensitive towards yeah. such things that uh, i mean i think of course some things are completely bizarre so, like you would call it like i was reading the other day i think there was a, a bjp mla who's filed a suit against uh, amitabh bachchan and kbc because they asked a question on uh, i think ambedkar in terms of which was the uh, sacred book that he went and burned uh, huh. only you know from from a perspective of wanting to <laughs> abolish this whole caste system and i think all the options were given with regard to were of hindu mythology books so it's your how can you give all options which are concerning hindu mythology because uh, i mean he's trying to disrespect the hindu religion so to speak so something sometimes it's absolutely bizarre in terms of the kind of issues people raise but from all of this all we understand is that uh, the audience is extremely sensitive they're yes. watching every and with the advent of social media right your every yeah. move is visible out there yeah. to pe- the people at large so now you got if you you got to be more conscious of uh, how you conduct yourself and the way you are yes. at any given point yeah people are interested in is... your personal life people are interested yes. in your professional life people are interested in you all the time <laughs> yes and uh, i think those are the price that people pay for being there uh, and uh, want to want to they also want to showcase what they can do uh, to increase the brand value so that's a that's a different topic altogether but yeah, yeah. i think it's understanding of uh, people like you uh, teaching them and uh, i think the way you say it spoke about the pro bono work that reach out we can tell you about the basic thing it may not be the hmm. the everything but at least something for you to be aware of thing i think ma- making aware is more important than uh, uh, completely having a full knowledge about it so absolutely so uh, on the on the personal agenda or the work that you've been doing one small question is uh, uh, that i have keeping the confidence in mind any any of the case that comes to your mind which actually gave a lot of learnings to you and uh, set the standard for probably the indian sports industry i wouldn't call it setting the standards for the indian sports industry i like to give nandan the credit for that i think uh, having yes. been the pioneer as and having started as far back as 2006 uh, yeah you know and yes. working on ipl and making <clears throat> sports law a known industry in india i think he you know he is put in a great amount of effort so i'll let him take that credit for yeah. you know sort of setting the standard and i don't think any way one particular case has anyway set the standard it's the people who worked in the industry and made the industry what it is today so of course there's no taking that away from nandan in any manner whatsoever but as far as a personal learning experience is concerned i mean i think uh, from a litigation perspective um i'd give that to uh, me representing sushil kumar before the delhi high court uh, when mm-hmm. you know during just before the 2016 olympics 
Right. So yeah, it was a selection dispute, and uh, all right. he wanted was a chance to just uh, get an opportunity to get selected to then represent India. Well, that didn't happen. But I mean, we only got the case at on. I think it was. I still remember it was May sixteenth or May seventeenth. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the next two weeks, like by June second, we had the final. We lost the case, but uh, we had the final order in our hands. So, but for those three weeks. we literally like slept and woke up in office i mean there was no sleeping to be honest and it was it was amazing the kind of you know hard work that is, that was put in by the entire team including like mr amit sibal leading us at the top like he did the matter pro bono so there are senior advocates out there who you know if they believe in a cause they so that's what i was talking about earlier right yeah and when you <clears throat> athletes do get lucky and you do find lawyers who are more than happy to work pro bono and mr sibal i mean just because he was doing the pro matter pro bono it's not like he put in any less effort he used to yeah. be with us till 10 o'clock at night in conferences he used to give us a whole bunch of research to do at the end of each day and at 6 a.m he would wake up and he'd be following up with us in terms of okay what is the status have you found what i asked you to fight so it was it was so intense but it was such a great learning experience working with mr sibal a to start with obviously representing the legend that sushil kumar is the only two time olympic individual olympic medalist that there is from mm. india you know and uh, obviously learned a little bit uh, i don't want to comment on that uh, but just learned generally about the little bit of pol like politics that goes on in sport uh, about other issues that come mm. about in terms of you know and uh, i guess understood a whole lot i mean that time of course did a whole lot of research in terms of how selection procedures in other countries are followed and and this and that so learned about the best practices that there were in russia in america and every other country right and also i got the experience to learn about a new sport like i didn't know too much about wrestling until mm -hmm. that year 2016 i don't think i you know learned so much about combat sports until the time that i finally represent him so that definitely was like you know and i think at that point i still remember i had two interns also working i was about 4 years into practice but i had like two interns and they were equally hard working hmm. excited like every day in the morning i'd be like okay we need this sign by sushil kumar they'd be like okay ma'am and they'd be like taking the metro off to chhatrasal stadium to get the documents oh. signed and it was just like relentless and it was just you know great in terms of a team could come together you know a group of five of us working on it including those two interns it was just a group of five of us and of course mr sibal but it was it was just like a great learning experience on the whole even though we lost the case at the end of the day yeah. so that definitely as from a transactional perspective i think when you start working on something from day 1 and you see it grow in front of your eyes i think uh, that has been the case with uh, chennai nfc i've now been working with them for the last 5 odd years and again set up yeah. the table tennis league with the same team uh, from day 1 like 2015 is when we started working on table tennis so you know every day it's like uh and of course things did settle in the middle that we were yeah. working on an autopilot mode so to speak but otherwise every day is a new brainstorming session in terms of how we can you know improvise on certain things from season to season especially seeing table tennis grow the way it has grown yeah. as a sport uh the kind of you know um again the image it has created for the table tennis players manika reaching the levels that she has reached yeah. all of that right it's been i mean it's just so overwhelming to see uh we especially women athletes because yeah. it was also the first sort of league that was uh, i think after yeah after badminton it was then the first league to the sort of you know have this whole mixed doubles concept and have right. women and men equal participation and all of that so coming from uh, that space i think uh, it's been an exciting experience working on these two properties for the last 5 uh, years or right. more and uh, i mean i've been fortunate that they also moved with me from firm to firm and stuck around yeah. so i guess <laughs> It's, it's a great bunch of like Vita, Hiran, a great bunch of people to work with. So it's like they are so passionate about the sports at the same time understand business pretty well. So absolutely, you should uh, you should uh, like sometimes uh, somebody should be an audience to Hiran and my conversation because even though we're <laughs> at the same time, uh, same side, we're on two different sides of the coin. It's more like okay, so we're like constantly battling with each other. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. That's what makes it really exciting, you know. Like after after that, like fifteen minutes of a heated argument, I'm like, no, here this should be this way. He's like, no, no, this should be this way. And then after fifteen minutes, okay, let's let, uh, let's calm down. I think. I <laughs> 
I think that's <laughs> where the devil. That, that's that that's where the devil shadow character term came from, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then after he calms down, he's like, I think I need to buy you lunch. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so it's good oh, also okay. that you need to, you share that bond. I mean, we've all become friends over time or working together for so long that it's nice mm-hmm. that you can. Share. And I think that's also the really nice part about. working in sport that most people who work in sport are young so you tend to get along with them and it's always yeah. almost always like you're working with friends it's a very right. casual relationship and not the constant pressure of oh my god you have to be so formal but of course yeah. at the same time maintain professional ethics and yeah, conduct yes. <laughs> that being said uh, i think it's uh, it's exciting that you work with people who are the same age as you and uh, you know uh, you're all coming with your bunch of fresh ideas versus right. people who've been who've been working in the business for 30 40 years who have their old age old phenomena and they won't <laughs> budge from those <laughs> so yeah. i think uh, that sort of makes it makes it fun so again taking one another thing from the another earlier answer that you had other other answer that you had what is your take on legalizing betting and also the whole the fantasy that uh, the fantasy is not betting and it is game of skill so what is your take on that excellent uh, ana i think uh, i i asked for 30 minutes and i've got taken more than that time but it is a phenomenal talking to you and uh, so good to hear from you and i think it is uh, the talks can go on for long time but uh, this is this is very technological pause for now and uh, really appreciate your time and uh, thank you for being on sportsy where we just talk about sports thank you so much said for having me this is really fun and exciting and hopefully we'll do more fun stuff in the future take care looking forward to that thank you thank you thank you for watching thank you for liking and thank you for sharing but please do subscribe on the channel sportsy say that help us spread the word we go by the same name sportsy say across all the social media handles mm-hmm.